Welcome everyone uh, to today's EMSA Learn webinar, where we'll be discussing um, EMSA's capabilities on characterizing atmospheric aerosols. We would love to know where you're joining us from today. So drop a note in the chat to let us know where in the world are you? Are you here in the US? What city? Where else are you joining us from? Are you from Europe or some other uh, continent or country? Um, so, so far we have uh, joining us folks from uh, Ecuador and Croatia. I see Waco, Texas and oh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Welcome. Um, and oh, geez, I see Israel and is wow. And Vancouver, Canada. So we are an international community. This is this is just amazing. Um, before we move on uh, to the presenters today, I want to um, just briefly go over uh, next month for EMSA Learn um, webinars. We have uh, two, in fact. One will be on February 9th, um, and that one will provide information on the currently open EMSL JGI FICUS calls for proposal. If you are interested in submitting a FICUS call or a FICUS proposal this year, make sure that you attend February 9th. Um, the links for both of our open call for proposals are in the chat window at this moment. Um, and uh, our second EMSA Learn webinar um, is uh, focused on analyzing mineral and organic surfaces at EMSA. Uh, so, and that one will be February 23rd. Um, and we hope to see you there too. Um, also make sure to keep in touch with EMSL by subscribing to our newsletter and our social media channels if you haven't already. Again, links are in the chat for everyone. It's a really great way to keep in touch um, and keep up to date on uh, our open call for proposals and other opportunities to work with EMSL. And so for today, we are going to begin um, with PNNL chemist Ala Zelenuk Imri. Um, she is going to be providing um, us with uh, showcasing EMSL's unique single particle mass spectrometer for characterizing the physiochemical properties of individual particles. Uh, and then after Ala's presentation, Gorhar Kulkarni, um, a PNNL Earth scientist, He's going to be discussing um, our custom-built ice nucleation chamber for in-situ studies on the ice nucleating properties of atmospheric particles or aerosols. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, Chwarup China, who is uh, EMSL's chemist, and he will be presenting on how EMSL's microspectroscopy and mass spectrometry capabilities um, were used on collaborative projects that were funded through the EMSL and ARM, the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement User Facility, uh, through that uh, user facility proposals. And so um, after the presentations, um, we will have a quick Q&A. So if you have questions, make sure to drop them in the chat and we will discuss your questions afterward. And with that, I turn it over to Ala. Thank you, Linda. Hi, I'm Ala Zelenyuk, and today in this webinar, we will discuss a variety of different instruments and tools which we have here at EMSL and which are available for all EMSL users to characterize atmospheric aerosols. And I will start with a very brief introduction of why are we interested in properties of atmospheric aerosol particles. And the answer is very simple. The, in the air which we breathe in, they impact our health, Visibility, they impact climate, both directly by absorbing and scattering solar radiation and indirectly by activating as cloud droplets and ice crystals. Particles coming from many different sources. Some of them are natural, like sea salt, volcano eruption, dust particles, while others are related to anthropogenic activities. They come from emissions from combustion, like cars and biomass burning, they're coming from industry. And some particles like sea salt or dust are directly emitted, we call them primary aerosols, while other formed 
in atmosphere by oxidation of gas phase species emitted by trees and by industry. So we are interested in all of these different types of particles and to understand how they impact, mostly how they impact in climate. And at present, aerosol radiation climate I lost my control. Sorry. At present, aerosol radiation cloud interactions represent a significant source of uncertainties in climate model. And to understand impact of aerosols on both radiative transfer and clouds, it is critical to properly represent aerosol life cycle, understand how particles form, how they grow to climatically relevant sizes, how they transform during aging and transport, and how they eventually removed by wet or dry deposition and or by photolysis. And what makes this task is very, very, very challenging is that the fact that atmospheric aerosols come in many different sizes, composition, mix and state what comes is, with what on different particles, phases, shapes, and morphologies. Here you could see just a few examples of particles which were collected on micrographs or cartoons of particles containing secondary organic aerosols shown here at the bottom. And particle properties also change with time and location. Here at the bottom, example from high-scale field campaign, which took pl place close to ARM HGP site, which shows that depending on season, depending on different days, where we fly on time of the day, altitude, types of particles are changing and the impact on climate also will be very different. And what we found in this study is that all types, nearly all types of particles which we characterize contain different amount of secondary organic aerosol. So ideally what we want to do is to look at one particle at a time and to tell you how big it is, what it's made of, what it's cloud activating activity is, what optical properties are. And to do it, we develop our single particle mass spectrometer. We call it, I'm having trouble clicking, SPLAT2, and it's miniaturized version mini SPLAT shown here on this photograph. These instruments are available for deployment both in the laboratory and in the field, including on board of aircraft. And they make it possible to look at one particle at a time in situ and re in real time, and to tell you how big it is and what it's made of. And we can do it with very high sensitivity, very high temporal and very high size and resolution. And this very high sensitivity also makes it possible to look not only at all particles, but also at size and mass selected particles and determine many other particle properties listed here on the right. And I will illustrate many of these measurements in my talk. And I would like to point out that many of these measurements are done as part of EMSL user proposals. And in this approach, which we often term multidimensional single particle characterization, not only we could learn a lot about individual particles properties, but also about relationship between different particle properties, including aerosol size dependent composition, CCN activity or IN activity and reactivity. So let's start with first example where we're measuring using our single particle to measure particle number concentration with one second resolution. You could see here we're flying in and outside the cloud and measuring particle prop number concentration, particle sphericity, which depends on particle composition and shape. It's very important also to quantify measurements by single particle mass spectrometer and account for composition and shape dependent transmission efficiency and particle measurements of particle size distribution. Here, number concentration by less than one particle per cc, and we detected it in two minutes. And it's very important for some studies, like for example, for ice nucleation, for understanding particle ice nucleation activity, where concentration of this very special particles which activate as ice nuclei is extremely low. 
when we look at properties of site selected particles, as particles go goes on, sorry, we determine particle mass spectra. We looked at positive and negative mass spectra and quantify composition both of volatile and non volatile in each fraction of each particles. And we, we do this measurement in the lab, we could fine tailor our ionization approaches and characterize the composition of entire particles as shown here. We could drill inside and look what is on the surface of the particles, what is inside, or we could look at only at volatile fraction of particles. So different ways to quantify particle composition. When we looked at site selected particles, we could measure the additional properties like particle density, very important when we try to convert site distribution into mass loadings or calculate yields of formation for species like alpha pine and SOA or any other types of particles. Here you could see high resolution measurements of density for alpha pine and SOA particles. We find these particles as spherical and measure their density with very high precision and accuracy. We also show how condensation of SOA on the surface of cubic sodium chloride particles convert these particles into spherical. And we could determine it by looking at the shape of this line width. And for highly spherical particles like soot, we measure their fractal dimension, measure their mass in fraction of femtograms, could determine the size of these primary agglomerates, which make these fractal structures number of these agglomerates per aggregate of different size or mass, void fraction. And then we could monitor changes in shape of these particles as we deposit different coatings, in this case, SOA. We see these particles becoming spherical, their density is changing. And after removal of these coatings, we find that soot collapses and has very different effective density, void fraction. And as GK will show in his presentation, the CCA, the ice nucleating properties are changing and their optical properties are also changing. Particle viscosity, another properties which we are measuring is another very important properties which affect aerosol chemical reactivity, morphology and coalescence rates. In this study, we characterize uptake of ammonia by alpha pine and SOA particles. And what we show is that this exposure results in formation of very thin, four nanometer thin layer on the surface of SOA particles. And this very thin layer completely shuts down further ammonia uptake. And when two of these particles coagulate, they do not coalesce and remain as spherical kind of doublet particles for over two days. But when the semi-volatile layer evaporates, this particle coalesce on the time scales of two minutes, which allows us to calculate viscosity of these particles and follow their phase transformation. Another system which often exhibits this coagulated but not coalesce particles are other types of SOA. They are more viscous, like beta chlorophyllin SOA. In this case, particles with the same mass could be spherical or could be this spherical doublet. So with our approaches, we could separate these two different types of particles. And this watch how when these spherical particles coalesce at different relative humidity and measure their viscosity as function of relative humidity. It is also important to understand volatility of atmospheric particles to see how much they will shrink, how long they will survive when they transported far away from the sources. And we do it by this approach, which we developed in my lab to measure evaporation kinetics of site selected particles at room temperature, which allows us to avoid thermal decomposition, which is a problem in some of the experimental approaches. So in this approach, we're looking at volatility at both low and, rel and elevated relative humidity, which allows us again to separate these issues of particle volatility and viscosity. And for example, for beta chlorophyllin, we find that not only these particles more viscous, they also have significantly lower volatility compared to alpha pine. And from these measurements, we could extract volatility basis set. It could be incorporated into model. It shows that incorporated into model results in significantly 
better agreement between measurement and model compared to previous climate model prediction. And I also would like to point out that we do this measurements both on laboratory particles and on ambient aerosol, either by deploying instrument in the field or pulling particles through the inlet through Amsel roof. Just another example of actually several user projects, both from MTU, PNNL, and Oregon State University, which focus on synergetic interaction between biogenic secondary organic aerosols and anthropogenic emissions like toxic polyaromatic hydrocarbons. These measurements were done both in real time at EMSL. We look at enhancement in SOA formation due to presence of these pHs, their composition, higher fraction of oligomers. We could follow diffusion of these polyaromatic molecules within particles and measure chemical diffusivity, another measurement of particle viscosity. And we also collect these particles on substrate for offline analysis. This was done in MTU, high resolution composition analysis and GCMS in Oregon State. And also these findings about trapping and shielding of these toxic models, molecules was incorporated in their long range transport model. And again, we ob obtained significantly better agreement with measurement compared to previous approaches. And finally, just few examples of field measurements. Here we are using our single particle measurements of particle size and mixing state to understand, and in many cases to model aerosol optical properties, CCN and IN activity. For example, in Storm Peak Lab, we explained day with very high aerosol optical deaths by long range transport of dust from Asia to Colorado. In California, we show that very small fraction of sea salt, which are super micron, are responsible for 80% of light scattering signal versus all absorption cell signal is explained by much smaller soot particles. We could follow particle composition along uh, airplane track and get look at changes in particle composition, size distribution, and all other observables which are measured on airplane, plane, and also look and model CCN properties of aerosol by using their composition resolve size distribution and conduct CCN closure. Here, just another example of CCN measurements from high scale where we find that cloud droplet residuals are larger and contain much more hygroscopic material like sulfate, nitrate, and IUPOX SOA consistent with color activation theory and in cloud formation of this species. And finally, my last examples compares properties of soil dust particles which enter custom, EMSL custom, ice nucleation chamber, and those very, very special ones which activated at warm temperature at minus 25 degrees. What we find that ice nucleating particles contain significantly higher fraction of organic and biological material compared to all grass soil dust which enters this ice nucleation chamber. And with this, I will pass it to GK, which will describe measurements by this custom ice nucleation chamber in much more details. Thanks, Ala. Um, so I'm going to discuss the uh, ice nucleation research capability uh, available for the users at uh, EMSL. Um, before, um, let's see, let's make it forward. Sorry. Uh, so before, uh, let me quickly uh, highlight the uh, the importance of INP research. Um, here I'm uh, showing an example where the uh, number of papers published in the uh, under uh, ice nucleation category, and you can see uh, that from last ten plus years, uh, there's a tremendous growth in the number of you know, papers published, um, showing that the you know uh, efforts going on in this area. And the reason for that is uh, twofold. Uh, one is the uh, it's just that we don't have uh, enough measurements, uh, especially there is uh, there is a need to characterize the ambient INP population, 
And second one is that we haven't really understood the uh, why certain aerosol pipes are more efficient uh, compared to others. For example, uh, the efficiency of the dust particles are better than the soot particles, and we haven't really understood that part. And so uh, this poor understanding has reflected into the uh, poor representation in a model. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, a comparison between the observations and the modeling results. Uh, the panel A shows the satellite observations of the uh, flux from the ice containing clouds uh, versus the panels B, C, D shows the, uh, the model results. And you can see that uh, they are uh, different. So uh, how you can improve this further, um, I'm not, I will lose. there you go. Um, so uh, the EMSOL, we have this ice inclusion chamber shown here on the left. Um, it has an uh, aerosol inlet at the top. Uh, and, and so uh, the a cross-sectional view of the chamber is shown on the uh, right. Uh, so the aerosols enter uh, at the top of the chamber. Uh, as they enter the chamber, in the first part of the chamber, uh, they're activated into droplet. So we call them a supercool droplet because the temperatures are below zero degrees C. Um, and then those droplets are exposed to different temperature conditions like minus 20, minus 30 degrees C in the evap section. And that's where the uh, droplet uh, freezes and the droplet which did not freeze basically evaporate or shrink. So at the end of the chamber, you have an OPC instrument, uh, which basically counts the number of ice crystals. And so using this information, you can calculate the, the frozen fraction or the onset. Uh, the table here on the, on the left here shows the specifications. Um, uh, chamber can be deployed in the lab as well in the field. It's a fully automated. Uh, the data frequency is one hertz, or you can adjust that as well as the, uh, you can go uh, the uh, deposition or immersion or homogeneous freezing modes in the chamber, which are highly relevant uh, in the atmosphere. Some reason I had difficult in the sliding further. Okay, so uh, here are some ideas regarding the, um, the application of the chamber, uh, starting with uh, you can run the chamber to develop the parameterization for a cloud model and all the way till uh, you can separate the ice crystal residues and uh, look into the composition and the morphology of them. And let me go through each example at a very high level. Uh, so in this example, uh, you can generate the uh, different type of aerosols and, um, and investigate their INP efficiency. So you can generate the polydispersed size distributions or they could be monodispersed. Uh, you can dry disperse or you can wet atomize. And what you can do then is you can use this data uh, to either develop the new parameterizations or constrain the existing parameterizations. And then you can feed those parameterizations into a model uh, to understand the, the sensitivity of different experimental parameters on in a cloud field. Uh, in second example here, uh, you can modify the inlet of the chamber uh, to investigate the effect of uh, if you treat the particles versus the, if you untreat the particles and you can compare. So here I'm showing you an example of organic particles which are humidified, then free sublimated. And you look at the INP efficiency of those treated particles and compare uh, against the untreated particles, uh, just then you'll understand more about what aerosol properties actually affect the INP efficiency. And basically the idea here is in simplified way is to, you are simulating a individual aerosol particle uh, trajectory of that in the atmosphere. Um, as I said, mentioned before, the chamber can be run autonomously. Uh, and here I'm showing you the, the time series of ambient and peak concentrations at uh, three different temperatures. Uh, and what you can do with this information is you can um, connect this information or link this information to the, uh, the meteorological conditions like a wind, uh, clouds, uh, the temperature, the humidity. Um, and also if you have any co-located uh, site distribution or the composition or the morphological information, what you can do is you can do what you call the INP closure. So such studies are very important uh, to develop the parameterization for a model 
to represent the uh, the ice containing uh, particles um, in the in the cloud model or cloud uh, climate model. So uh, the uh, another instrument that you can connect to the at the bottom of the ice chamber is the PCBI. Uh, it is very uh, tiny instrument, but very powerful. That what it does is it allows you to separate the large ice crystals uh, from the interstitial particles, the particles which did not neglect ice. Uh, so I'm going to show in a small movie here. So what you have is at the end of the chamber is the mixture of ice crystals and interstitial particles. And in this movie, you will see the in a simplified a working principle of it is. Uh, and what it's doing is basically you can separate the uh, the ice crystals. Uh, from the interstitial particles. And these ice crystals, uh, you can then, uh, you can crack open these ice crystals and, and uh, you have the residues and you can send those residues to mass spectrometers or uh, in a single particle composition analysis instruments to look into what is so specific or what is so special about those uh, individual particles that nuclear ice compared to uh, the particles that did not nuclear the ice. So you can do a lot of things once you have a PCBI hooked up to the chamber. Um, here's an example. Um, let's see, people are going further. Okay, so um, here's an example again uh, uh, about the PCBI application, um, showing you uh, you can connect the two ice chambers in series. So idea is that uh, you have residuals coming from chamber one and you transport it to the chamber two and a look at the ion efficiency. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, tool to understand more about the aerosols. Uh, and you can see at the bottom here in a figure showing you the comparison of ion efficiency of the uh, interstitial particles uh, and the residual particles. And you can see that there is a temperature dependency there. Um, in the past, uh, the chamber has been deployed uh, at the Stompy lab. Um, the idea was to characterize the ion pay efficiency of the, you know, this continental background aerosol, as well as the, uh, the analysis of uh, ice crystal residues, what the composition of those is. Um, I'm not going to go over the, the results of ion efficiency, but I think it was, uh, it's important to highlight the, uh, the composition results here. So you can see that on the left is the composition of the total aerosols. Um, and on the right is the composition of the ice crystals residues or the INP composition. And you can see uh, there's a difference there. And such you know, results are important. Such mixing state data is so important to uh, develop the INP parameterizations, uh, which are actually needed. And finally, uh, you can deploy uh, the chamber as a part of a research campaign. Um, so here is an example where the chamber was deployed with other co-located uh, instruments that provided the, uh, the composition, provided the gas phase properties, optical properties, mixing state properties, hygroscopicity, site distribution. And what you can do is you can combine all this data set to understand more about the, the INP itself. That helps to understand or to develop the you know, the parameterization for the, uh, the model. So uh, here is an example is showing is the, the onsets um, at different experimental conditions and the uh, uh, temperature uh, showing you the, the um, basically how experimental condition changes the onset. Um, what you can further do with this information is you can develop some hypothesis of ice inclusion mechanisms and that you can use that for, to develop the parameterization for a, a model. And finally, uh, the uh, figure on the, the right shows the, uh, you can look at the morphology of uh, ice crystal residues as well as the supercooled droplet residues uh, uh, and you can understand how the cloud processing is affecting the uh, the morphology. And with that, Elaine, and thank you. I send it to Sarup now. Thank you, Chike, um, and Allah for setting up the stage. Um, so I will uh, briefly discuss about the different um, offline analysis method that uh, we have at EMSA and how we can answer some of the research questions. Um, 
Yes. Uh, so, um, as Alan GK mentioned, the atmospheric particles are often very complex, and to try to understand their uh, uh, different properties, we often uh, look at uh, different angles. So, we try to use multimodal approach looking from microscopy, spectroscopy, and mass spec approaches to answer the scientific questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, and uh, today, I'll briefly mention some of the key uh, approaches that we use in our lab. And there are uh, several others that are available at EMSOL that I will not have uh, a chance to explain in details. But if you have more questions, please feel free to ask later. So uh, the one of the uh, instrument that typically use uh, to um, uh, understand the uh, atmospheric aerosol processes in general is the size result uh, aerosol composition, which is obtained by the computer controlled scanning, scanning electron microscopy coupled with energy dispersive uh, X ray spectrometer, the CCACM EDX. And in the east uh, side on the top right corner, I'll mention the the substrate and the, uh, the sampling approach that was used for different. Uh, um, uh, different uh, method that we apply. So on the left one, you can see an example here is a size resolved uh, chemical composition obtained from the CCSM from a remote marine environment where we are trying to understand how different transport patterns affect uh, the chemical composition. And um, here you get uh, the once you, you, you look at individual particles and get the size and morphology and also the chemical composition, um, elemental composition specifically, and then you can classify the particles into different groups. And this uh, size resolved chemical composition is a, a key um, information, as you see from Alas and GK stock, that really needed to answer specific, um, you know, some atmospheric science related question. And I, on the right side, I highlighted some of the uh, groups uh, work that collaborate with EMSO regularly kind of to answer different questions, like starting from uh, sources of Arctic aerosol to look at the long range transported particles, uh, looking at the bio aerosol, or even looking at the biomass burning or optical properties of aerosol. Uh, the, the second one that I want to highlight is that uh, the, our environmental uh, scanning electron microscope, the ESM chamber where we want to look at the hygroscopicity of individual particles. And I just want to highlight that this is very key for when we look at the atmospheric particles, when you have a lot of varieties in your particles, you expect a lot of different size and the composition. And here I'm showing one example on the top of biological particles and how with control temperature and keep increasing the humidity, how you can see the growth of the particles. And then you can see the growth factor of the particles as a function of rate of humidity. And the below example is from the biomass burning aerosol, where you can see some of the particles uptake water at 98.5% humidity and others did not. So idea is that looking at the, the tracking individual particles and then map their elemental composition and, and the, the growth factor, then we can get an idea about how which specific particles activated and which are not activated and how what are the role of like size, composition, and mixing state on the hygroscopicity of these particles. Uh, the next one, um, again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just, again, providing just a very brief highlight of different uh, instrument that we have and how we can answer different scientific question here. So uh, the, the next one I'm going to talk about the, is the same chamber, the same chamber that you use, but it's a, a custom built stage uh, to understand the phase of the atmospheric aerosol, which was explained by Alain Jike. So these uh, particles can be exist in either solid, uh, semi-solid or liquid state. And we want to understand how this phase changes uh, in for atmospheric particles, especially at the submicron scale with, as a function of temperature and humidity. So with this stage, we can look at uh, track individual particles and uh, we keep the temperature constant and then increase the humidity and see how the particles are changing their, the shape. And you can see from uh, looking at the, the tilt angle with, as a function of humidity, it's the particles getting flattened out. So particles uh, transitioning from solid to semi-solid and being, becoming liquid at the end. So again, this uh, uh, 
technique will be useful for when we are looking at specifically the ambient particles when the, there are some microns in size range and specifically when um, the particle concentration is very low. So often we cannot uh, apply the online instruments. We can collect particles on a substrate and then look at the individual particle phase state as a function of humidity. And for the temperature, we so far we can control the temperature up to minus 10 degrees Celsius for, the, for this kind of, kind of experiments. Um, the next, um, uh, I'll mention about the ice formation, who, again, which was mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit defined approach, what uh, GK mentioned, where instead of getting a higher statistics uh, and frozen fraction, here we are looking at more like a fundamental ice formation. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll explain briefly like how this ex defined experimental setup within, using the same instrument can give you a specific uh, you know, uh, question that you can ask. So here you're looking at the uh, the the opening of the uh, scanning area that we're looking at around 500 micron on uh, this aperture of the uh, electron gun um, in the ESM mode. And then you can keep uh, decreasing the temperature of the substrate and basically increasing the rate of humidity with respect to ice. And you can see from where ice is start forming. And then you can get the thermodynamic properties like temperature and the humidity where the ice formation started. Uh, other case, if you really want to focus on single particle uh, uh, freezing events, like you really want to understand, like you have internally mixed particles and from where the ice formation started. So we can zoom in into one of the individual particles and try to see from where the um, ice formation started. And this is one example in the immersion mode where we can see the dust particles mixed with the biological particle is start up taking water and then finally form the ice. Uh, other thing, uh, what GK was mentioning about the INP residuals. So here again, instead of uh, looking at the separating the residuals, what we do is we, we, we form the ice and then we start sublimating the ice. So you can see, for example, here, there was a three ice crystal form on the substrate. And then we start sublimating the ice and then we can track those individual particles and try to get their size and the composition and see what are the specialty about those particles and then compare with the total particle population. And the other experiment that you can design is that uh, looking at more surface defects, so you can modulate your, your substrate, changing the com uh, uh, composition of the substrate and then get some surface defects. And you can see at high spatial resolution that from where the ice formation started. This is an example from a natural mica substrate. Uh, uh, so next, I'll move uh, to the our high resolution mass spec capability. And at EMSO, there are like different mass spec capability available. So I'm talking about the one mostly that we use for our services that we have in our lab. It's a nano DC high resolution mass spec, and this can be integrated into a, any mass analyzer is a is an orbit wrap or FTICR instruments. So uh, for nano DC, the advantage is that we can look at the um, the molecular composition directly from the filter, especially for aerosol also samples when the sample mass is quite low. And then we can look at the, the molecular composition. Here I'm showing one example as looking at the organic aerosol composition and at the one agriculture land from DOE arm site where we're looking at the, how the molecular composition changes during daytime and nighttime and the light panel shows the the probability distribution that Ala was mentioning that is really critical to understand and the growth or the evaporation of the particles. So we really see the dynamics, uh, how the particles they are evolved in the atmosphere and at the molecular level. Um, so uh, next, uh, I'll, uh, I was talking about so far the physical and chemical properties, and now I'll move uh, to our, um, our the optical properties. So uh, I'll briefly explain the one of the capabilities that we have is the scanning transmission, uh, electron microscopy with uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy. And with this technique, you can um, estimate the optical properties of individual particles and, uh, and the broad uh, wavelength region. Uh, so again, the idea is that when we really try to understand the optical properties of, you know, in the atmosphere, there are a lot of uh, different mixture of particles. And if we really try to understand one specific class of particles, uh, then we can look particles one by particle specific optical properties. Uh, the limitation of this method is that you can uh, do only for particles that are spherical in shape, a particular size range, and also need to be resistant to the electron beam. 
So here I'm showing one example of one specific type of particles that are emitted in the smoldering phase of the uh, fire. Um, and uh, here we're looking at both one example is more like homogeneous mixing, one is internally mixed particle, and try to see how the uh, effective index exchanges, and then from that we can derive the optical properties. And uh, the advantage is that here we can look at the wide range of wavelength, which can be really useful for climate modeling perspective. Um, other method we have um, also the photoacoustic extensiometer, where we can look at ensemble of particles, instead of looking at individual particles, and that can be that is the institute instrument where we can look uh, either lab generated also or the ambient also samples. Um, the next I'll uh, briefly mention about uh, recent collaboration, and I know that some of you asked this big question about this topic. Uh, and as you see, uh, also there was a call came out from the ARM and EMS of ICAS project. So this related to uh, one project that is in collaboration with ARM, and we developed a size, size and time with of aerosol collector uh, for uh, arms still up demo sampling. Uh, so idea is that we really want to look at the particle profile of aerosol composition uh, to answer a very specific question either related to land atmosphere interaction or if you're looking into the aerosol cloud interaction. So uh, we built uh, in collaboration with ARM a impactor which can be fitted with a TBS system. This is um, well, uh, uh, relatively uh, small in size and high collection efficiency, and that can go at different altitude. Um, uh, and looking at the different layer in the atmosphere and see how the their composition and the size changes. And there are multiple substrate of uh, look uh, of arranged on this impactor, so we can do all different kind of analysis that was mentioned in my previous slides. And so far, this has been deployed in Alaska and at the ZP site in Oklahoma, and also some initial flight testing at the sale campaign. And um, the stack will be deployed with the TBS system in the upcoming campaign, uh, starting from next month, actually, in, um, at the ZP site, we'll, we'll do the seasonal study, and also it will be deployed at the sale and tesla campaign. And in addition, and this, there was a limitation of uh, uh, amount of particles that we deposit for, for the stack because this is specifically designed for single particle analysis. So as you expect that we often don't get enough mass for um, high resolution uh, mass spec analysis. Uh, we, we, we perform some analysis when the concentration was very, very high, but often let's say if you have a particle concentration at 500 particles per cc, it is difficult to get enough particles on the substrate. So for that, we also uh, planning to deploy a uh, uh, time resolved bulk aerosol collector, which will collect um, uh, um, the bulk aerosol, which was, uh, should give a few, uh, sufficient amount of particles for is a defined kind of bulk analysis method and also have extraction based uh, high resolution mass spec analysis. Um, uh, I want to show one example of the um, uh, activities with the ARM campaign. Um, here you can look at uh, one example from the um, Alaska site um, in the Ovecto point by looking at the different layer of the clouds. And um, the good part is that also we have some uh, in-situ measurement from the arm side that can be used for both aerosol and cloud properties in conjunction with the, with the TPS system. So here you can see an example, um, that we're looking at the above clouds and how the size and the composition changes. Uh, as we expect, uh, you see a lot of sulfur particles at the above clouds, and then you see a lot of uh, carbonaceous and sulfur particles in, in the cloud. So you can really look at the, uh, different atmospheric processes that are happening in cloud or above cloud and try to understand the, uh, you know, uh, of, of these properties. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I'll end up with this slide, which was kind of um, a summary of some of the methods that are already explained by ALA and GK and our offline analysis. So this is, we are trying to understand the ice nucleation properties of a, a soil dust particle. So this is done uh, using GK's ice nucleation chamber and trying to understand uh, to define the soil dust particles and try to understand why this, um, um, the difference in ice nucleation properties. So we, uh, we applied as our single particle ap approach or using both um, 
um, uh, uh, CCSM EDX and also ALAS flat instrument, try to understand what are the difference between these two soil dust. And then also looking at the bulk properties, looking, for example, using the X-ray reflection method, uh, looking at the mineralogy, uh, mineralogy of the dust uh, particles, and then extract as soil organic matter, because we observed uh, a difference in um, ice nucleation properties of, uh, of this extracted soil organic matter and try to understand and if we can explain at the molecular level the ice nucleation uh, properties of these um, particular soil types. With that, I will finish and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. And I also give our contact information if you have any specific questions for us. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for your amazing presentations. Um, we are now moving into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so again, folks out there, if you have questions, make sure to drop them in the chat. We've been pulling your questions that you've asked during the presentations. Um, and so we're going to um, start talking about them now. And, um, and if it you know, inspires more questions, uh, other people's questions, again, feel free, drop them in the chat and we'll we'll get to them. So um, to start, let's see. So Ala, um, we had a couple questions for you. Uh, let's start with what makes EMSL's aerosol mass spectrometer different than other similar instruments in the field? Well, I think first of all, I would like to point out the difference between the mostly common use aerosol mass spectrometer AMS. Unlike AMS, which looks mainly at bulk aerosol composition of non-refractory, SPLAT looks at individual particles, both refractory and non-refractory in each individual particle. So it is a single particle mass spectrometer. Compared to other single particle mass spectrometer, I think we have significantly higher sensitivity, especially towards small particles. You know, often I said, we have our mantra, we could, if there is one particle PCC, we could detect it in one second, which enables many of very unique studies. And moreover, this multidimensional analysis where we measure many different properties on the same particle is something which makes our instrument not very special and allow us to learn a lot, but also makes it quantitative. Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions for you, Ala, but I'm going to rotate through. So GK, we've got one for you. Um, can the ice chamber be deployed in the field? That's a good question. So yeah, uh, so ice chamber has the capability to deploy in the field. Uh, you can run that in uh, autonomous mode also, and you can scan uh, at different temperature and, uh, and equally part of any other collocated measurements too. So yes, answer is. Yeah, all right. Um, and then one for you, Shorup. Uh, you referred to the IN um, ESCM method, but the resource needs, uh, but the resource needs template refers to environmental transmission electron microscopy. Is, is this the same? Uh, no, it's not the same actually. So uh, yeah, sometimes it can be misreading. So the uh, instrument that comes under this is called uh, computer controlled scanning electron microscopy, then slash ice nucleation stage. So that's the instrument that is uh, listed under the aerosol characterization. All right. Um, Ala, back to you. Has mini splat flown on or can it fly on board arms tethered balloon system? No, it cannot. It could fly on aircraft, but it cannot. I mean, it's not yay big, it's not handheld. So we do our measurements, altitude dependent measurements on board of aircraft. Hmm. Okay. Um, and GK, back to you. Would you train users to operate uh, the ice chamber? Yes, I do. So uh, it's like, uh half day to two days training, uh, any user can uh, readily use it uh, either in the field or in the lab. Um, it's uh, all the software operation are fully automated and it's very easy to uh, do those operations, so. Okay. Um, Shwarup, let's see. Uh, 
What is the temperature range that single particle freezing experiments can be performed? Um, can you do both deposition and immersion freezing experiments? Uh, yes, the chamber can do both uh, deposition and uh, immersion freezing experiment and typically we use for between 205 Kelvin to up to like 255 to 60 Kelvin. But uh, if you look for single particle freezing events, typically the, the colder temperature is better because you have less uh, water vapor available, so you can clearly see the growth of the individual ice crystals. Okay. And, and another question actually for you again, Sharp. The SCM uh, D or EDS, what is the particle range or the particle size range for measurements? Also, are thin sections necessary, or can you analyze raw samples, such as small quantities of dust particulates? Uh, so to answer your question, the SCM EDX, typically we uh, uh, measure the size range from 100 nanometer to up to five micron, but it can be measured larger particles as well. Just uh, need to be make sure that when the particles are thick, that's related to the second question. If the particles are thick, you getting the composition from the surface that depends on the, the, the voltage and the current you are using, typically like around one micron depth of the, your samples. And uh, for our analysis, we don't quote any samples. So that's the main um, uh, advantage of the using ESM. So we just use the raw samples and uh, perform the analysis. We don't do any sample preparation or quoting of the samples. Okay. Ala, uh, does the splat measure only the volatile fraction of the particle? No, we are measuring both volatile and non-volatile fraction in each particle. So we could look at this volatile like organic coating on top of soot particles or dust particles. We are analyzing both fraction in each particles. Okay. Um, this one doesn't have a to a specific person. So I'm just going to throw the question out and see who picks it up. <laughs> um, from a biological point of view, do you have any tips for characterizing signatures of pyrogenic aerosols? That means uh, it, those particles do have some biomass burning uh, elements attached to it. I think Allah's flat, I think it's a powerful instrument. <laughs> yes, both me and Swaroop have a lot of experience analyzing particles produced by biomass burning, both after long range transport and collecting from local fires. We're looking at the complex, very complex composition, viscosity, many of them are the star balls, optical properties. So and we have both signatures for particles, biomass generated particles, which carry signatures of primary aerosols and also secondary organic aerosols, which are associated with biomass burning, burning sources. And they have significant differences in the mass spectral signatures and composition. Okay. Um, here's another one that doesn't have um, to a, a, a it's a, actually a series of questions that is not for any particular person. So um, there's three questions in this one. What is the typical output of ICRs that go through mass spec? Can this processing be automated for high throughput? And is there a similar pipeline between the EMSL offline droplet assay and the MS instruments? And I can repeat those if you need. <laughs> Um, so I, I can briefly answer the, the ICR part because I, first of all, it's not, I'm, I'm not an expert. There are specific uh, people that have run those instruments, so they have the more expertise on that. But for example, our uh, nanolase instrument that can go to the ICR instrument. Um, and uh, But there are also the auto sampler uh, that are used in the ESI mode, I guess, and that can be used for high throughput analysis um, is in the direct infusion. Um, and uh, and the second question is, can this person automated for high throughput? Yeah, so that was the, there is a, a automated auto sample method that can go with the, with the ESI, the ICF instrument. And is there a similar pipeline between the EMSO offline doctorate essay and MS instrument? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, actually, Ala, do you know what? Uh, I think it was the latest clarification that ICR, it's ice crystal residuals. 
So it was. Oh, it's for, not FBI. I said, okay, sorry, never mind. Um, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> So is there a similar pipeline um, or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the ice crystal residuals can be uh, you know, transported to the, to the splat um, and also in a paddle, uh, they can be also collected on grids for further morphological analysis. And uh, currently we are in the process of deploying the whole operation autonomously. So basically the chamber, PCVI and further downstream instruments, you can run continuously. Um, it's not tested, but uh, we have our design is ready for that to do it. That's possible. Okay. We have um, a few more or a couple more minutes, so um, I'll see how many more questions we can get to. Um, Ala or Ala, let's do. Um, so, is the mini splat? Is it quantitative? How do you deal with um, information on millions of individual particles? So the instrument is quantitative and to achieve this quantification, we correct for size and composition dependent transmission efficiency and employ this multi-dimensional single particle characterization I was briefly referring to. And indeed during typical experiments, especially during field campaign, we are obtaining information on millions of individual particles. But to deal with it, we develop spe very special software, which allows us not only to visualize different particle properties, but also to explore correlations, anti-correlation, causation. And you know, I had the screen captures. You could pull out only particles in Arctic, in the cloud, which activated as cloud condensation nuclei and compare them to those which did not. So it relies on very special approaches to visualize and analyze data. Great. Um, we have one more question, or I think we have time for just one more question and it's gotta be quick. So uh, GK, how do you collect and analyze ice crystal residuals? Did we already answer that? Um, I can briefly again or? mention this. So uh, there are multiple approaches. One is uh, you can continuously keep collecting um, or sending them to the, the mass spec, like a la the splat, or you can collect them on a grid, um, and then you can uh, analyze the grids later. Uh, so you can do the both you know online and offline analysis of the ice residuals, and depending upon the application and the research question. So, all right. Uh, well, with that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact the, the panelists or contact us um, uh, based on the information in the chat window. Um, and we hope to see you at the February 9th uh, EMSA Learn webinar on um, submitting a FICUS proposal for the JGI uh, EMSA FICUS call. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.